Need for Speed Underground 2 is 20 years old. What? Last year, in that love letter of a video talking about Need for Speed Underground 1, I talked about how that game still holds up surprisingly well, and how it helped me overcome the traumatic experience of moving to the UK. I finished off that video talking about how, while the first game is good, Underground 2 is where things really kick off making it not only probably the best game in the entire franchise, but also still probably one of the best racing games ever made. Because what happens when you take the amazing foundation of Underground 1, the atmosphere, the mechanics and much more, and take everything to the next level while also giving us a giant open world to explore. And all of that was done on an annual release cycle. So I guess let's just start at, well, the start. Underground 2 takes place a couple of months after the events of the very first game, with a quick intro video showing you what's up, presented in its comic book style, which is already a pretty large departure from Underground 1, which pretty much fixes one of my biggest gripes with the game, that being the cutscenes. They were so short and compressed that you could barely tell what's going on, and it didn't really convey much of a story. While here, by going with a completely different approach, they're able to actually take their time. In fact, I'm pretty sure that this intro cutscene is is longer than all of the cutscenes in Underground 1 put together. And I gotta say, even though going to static 2D images might seem like going backwards, given the level of the CG in the original and how unnatural all of the characters looked, I'd say it's still probably the better of the two options here, especially because it also gives the game its own unique character in that regard. Basically the story is that after the events of the first game, some mysterious dude wrecks up your car and then soon after you're off to Bayview for a new adventure. This is also the first time we get a proper-ish look at the protagonist and you look like this, apparently. Don't get me wrong, the story is still very much in the background and not really getting in the way, just like in the original. It isn't until Most Wanted where the story actually takes anything close to center stage. Before you know it, you arrive in Bayview, the big open world setting of Underground 2. And as is tradition with Need for Speed games, you start off with a late game car to get you all excited before dumping you back into an untuned vehicle. In this case, Rachel's iconic green Nissan Free. 50Z. Which sure maybe isn't as iconic as Eddie's Skyline, but still a beautiful car in its own right. At that point, you're given your first task of going to a car lot to pick out the vehicle you'll be stuck with. However, you're already given your very first choice. It is an open world, after all, and the game wants you to know it right off the bat. As you get these voicemails from people who think you are Rachel about races happening in the city, and you can very much just take a detour and run these races before you even return the car. So while the game does not begin with a race, like with Underground 1, it's basically just a way of the developers telling you, it's an open world, do whatever you want and I just imagine how smart and how smug the developers must have felt when they came up with this as a way of telling the player that you can do whatever you want and that the world is your oyster before you even return the 350z. I however am a good boy and I don't want to make Rachel mad so I return her car straight away without doing any races and then of course you meet the female lead of this game Rachel Teller played by the American TV personality Brooke Burke and she's probably one of my favorite Need for Speed girls ever. This self-assured confident and bossy lady who basically runs the entire underground racing scene in Bayview. She's not overdone or overdesigned as a character, however the kind of confidence that naturally radiates out of the character makes her a standout in the Need for Speed franchise. And it's pretty impressive how much the game is able to make me like her, even though you only ever see her in a 2D form, because again, 
there are no 3D cutscenes here. But even in just the static drawings and all of the voice messages, she's able to just be a character regardless. It's actually pretty impressive. I think I'm starting to get why people get so attracted to other 2D cartoon characters like in manga or something. Brooke even got the Spike TV Video Game Award for her performance in this game. And hey, she was given the award by Snoop Dogg himself, which I gotta say is fitting. And by the way, if you ever want a great time capsule, you have to go back and watch those old Spike PGA shows. They were something truly special. I thought I was gonna come up here originally and show Snoop how to drop it like it's hot, but my skirt is too short. <laughs> then of course you have to make one of the most important decisions in your adult life. And that is of course picking your starting car. With the options this time around being a Peugeot 206, a Ford Focus, Toyota Corolla, Nissan 240SX, a Mazda MX-5, or a Honda Civic. And I'll say the same thing I said last time, if you're playing an import tuner game where you're not choosing a Japanese car, then you're playing it wrong. From there, you're left to explore the world on your own. Again, but this time in a painfully slow car by comparison. And you can choose to do any of the races highlighted on the map, or just explore Bayview and take your time. And man, Bayview. What a setting for a game. It still remains one of my favorite cities in any Need for Speed entry because it just has so much character. All the locations are just so well designed and it's just so fun to explore it. Even though I gotta admit it may not have as much detail as some of the highlights of Underground 1's Olympic City. Which is the case pretty much any time you go open world and you lose the amount of control that you have with a more linear environment. I just love how well designed and creative they get with the city here. Even if again some areas don't have as much detail as Olympic City, but there's also so many other genius little ideas here, like driving up the steps on this plaza, or literally going into a steel mill, where I have no idea how your car is literally not melting inside, but still, it looks awesome, and the kind of details we don't get enough in more modern Need for Speed games. Unfortunately, the game doesn't take too much advantage out of these areas in the actual races, but oh well. But it's still such a fun city to explore between the beautiful areas like South Market, its complicated spaghetti-esque highway system, or just the sight of all of the skyscrapers in the distance. It's pretty sweet, and also perfectly matches the change in overall atmosphere compared to Underground 1. That game and Olympic City were a lot more, for lack of a better word, gritty. The city was dirty, and even had some bombed out ruins in certain places, and while it did have its better areas, they didn't really swing too much either which way between ugly and desolate, and all out mega luxury. Bayview and Underground 2 as a whole is very different in that regard, given the fact how it combines the grittiness of Underground 1, but with a kind of glitz and glam of the West Coast setting. And that is very much on show pretty much everywhere in the city. Given how everything is just brighter, more modern, just looks plain old better as a city compared to its predecessor, and everything exudes this kind of mix of personalities between those two extremes of the more dirty and downtrodden and the heights of luxury. Given the overall presentation of the game itself, the one thing that strangely doesn't reflect this as much as I would have hoped is the UI. Given how it just mostly goes for this grey aesthetic, while we had this iconic off cyan colour everywhere in Underground 1. And then there's of course the music, which is probably the best example of this kind of change in tone, with a large focus on this clash between rap, hip-hop, more rocky tracks, which even includes stuff like Rise Against and Queens of the Stone Age, to the more electronic sounds as well, all of it forming the perfect background to this game. And then there's of course the main theme. Seeing how Underground 1's intro song was this more rough and edgy hip-hop track, where let's be honest, the hilarious censoring definitely made it a lot less gritty than they probably intended, while here we have something completely different. A cover of Riders on the Storm by Snoop Dogg. And it is probably one of the best intro songs in the entire franchise. It perfectly combines hip hop with rock and these jazz and bluesy elements creating such a beautiful symphony. It just has the perfect vibe for the game, and it's the kind of track you'd put on in your own car while traversing your own city at night with rain gently falling outside. It is just beautiful.
But okay, that's how it feels to be in Bayview, but how does it feel to actually drive around there? Well, of course, the big selling point of Underground 2 is the open world, meaning that you can explore the entire environment you'll be racing in later. The city isn't mega expansive, it is still a game from 2004, it's big enough to hold all the content it needs to hold. And it was actually planned to be even bigger, judging by these early concepts, where there was an entire new district in the northeast out in the desert, which looks like would have had some pretty awesome areas in it, but unfortunately it was not meant to be, either because of time or hardware constraints, most likely both. However, apart from just going from one race icon to another, there is several other things to actually engage with here, but one of the biggest being the various shops. Unlike previously, where you just did everything from the same menu, here you actually have to drive around the city to various shops where you can upgrade your car, however they all start off hidden and you have to find them yourself by just roaming around a free world. You usually know when you're near one because of these coloured lights signalling the entrance. That is such a simple yet great way to give the open world a bit more of a purpose and a commute between one event and another. One of the biggest dilemmas with things like an open world in a racing game is, well why bother? Apart from just being cool to explore, there has to be something a bit more to it to make it worth the effort, because otherwise, why not just give us a list of events we can just go into, rather than having us drive with nothing to do in between. It's literally just a pointless commute that is far less efficient than just a simple menu. And yes, I get it, just the appeal of an open world, even if there isn't too much to do in it, is in itself kind of appealing. I mean, just look at how much people want to discover Olympic City in a free roam mode. However, I'd imagine the appeal of that would run out pretty quickly, if it was possible, when players would discover there's just not much to do there. And the kind of mystique that surrounds Olympic City, because we don't see a lot of it, would also go away. An open world for the sake of an open world isn't that bad. However, the developers that went the ground to did their best to justify it being an open world and not just doing it for a gimmick's sake. Finding new shops is not only how you can change up your car in various areas, for example the body of the car, all of the performance elements or its paint, but also by finding a new shops you unlock new upgrades as well. But that's not all. Scattered around the world you can also find money, which I have no idea what just random money is doing on the floor anyway, but that's nice and also random game tips, which usually aren't very helpful, but this comes from an era of gaming where offering your players as many game tips as possible was just kind of the normal thing to do. You can also find hidden races throughout the game world, though they don't really differ too much from the regular kind apart from the fact they're not marked on the map. And also, thankfully, this game doesn't commit the cardinal sin of open world racing games, that is having fast travel. I will never understand how developers can justify fast travel in a game where you're driving probably the most efficient mode of transport for quickly getting from point A to point B. Here, there's none of that, which of course just makes the most sense in the world. That also means that as your car becomes faster as the game progresses, you're not only faster in races, but you can also travel to new races much quicker, basically making decreasing that commute time a reward in itself. I know that some people probably don't like all of this. I know some people will say it's annoying that you have to travel between different shops to customize your car, and that it's annoying to have to go all the way up Jackson Heights just to access a new race. And sure, I get it to a point, but I gotta say that above all else, it achieves its main objective of giving the open world purpose and making it fun to explore, giving it activities apart from just going from one race to another that actually make sense in the context of the game, and are more engaging and offer more rewards than, I don't know, smashing flamingos? So that's all the stuff in between the races, but how about the races themselves? Like I said in last year's video, in an inherently repetitive genre like racing games, having as much variety in tracks and events is extremely important to keep the game fresh. And Underground 2 delivers on that, given exactly how many different events there are to choose from. With eight different race types in total. 
Naturally, your old favorites like Circuit and Sprint return once again with pretty much no changes. However, one important thing to point out is that there is no lap knockout circuits anymore, even if that option is still available in custom races. Drifts, one of the two big new modes from last time, also returns, this time with a couple of changes, with one of the big ones, of course, being how everyone goes at once, instead of last time where you just drove on your own and the others, I assumed, just drove before or after you. This was obviously mostly done because last time you could just take your time around the course to get those extra points because you had no one else to race against. Now the way it works is that when the first person reaches the finish line you get a rather generous countdown until when you have to finish the race as well. This has its pros and cons. Obviously it makes it a lot more chaotic and you may imagine can make it a lot more difficult to get a proper drift going when you're constantly crashing into people. Though thankfully crashing into another racer does not stop your drift counter which is good. Obviously it can be annoying when a car gets in your way and it kind of messes up your plans on how you want to tackle a corner but on the other hand it can also have the opposite effect. If you are bound to crash into the side and lose your points you can just cushion the crash on one of your opponents to keep the streak going. And the drift events range from pretty easy where you have quite a big advantage compared to second place to ones where I had to restart literally dozens of times which I'm definitely not the most proud of. Apart from the normal closed circuit drifts though you also have these downhill ones as well truly a sign of things to come with Need for Speed Carbon and it's still what I consider the golden age of drifting in these games especially when compared to the more modern titles where you pretty much can't compete at all unless you have a very specific car with specific tires here any car can drift again is it realistic maybe not but who cares because it means you can actually access these events from the very start Drag races are mostly unchanged, however the sensitivity of your revs meter has been kind of tweaked. Probably the biggest downgrade however is where you actually have the races at. I praised the drag events of the first game because they allowed you to explore huge chunks of the city that you just weren't able to see in any other mode, allowing you to see Olympic City from a completely different angle. They were able to get away with these huge tracks in the middle of the city, which of course aren't quite possible in an open world game from this time, because everything you see in the races has to be accessible in the main game world. And because of the hardware constraints at the time, they just simply weren't able to make the city that much bigger to accommodate the kind of drag races we saw in the first game. As such, most of the drag events just take place on the city's highway network, which sure is still cool enough, I guess, but just really decreases the overall diversity in locations in this mode. Though granted you also do have special races on the airport runway or through a rail yard, both of which are fun, however the novelty wears off pretty quickly. Time trials also make a return and once again they're mostly useful special events like for example getting your car on the cover of magazines or DVDs. And then there's a bunch of new events, for example Street X or Street Cross, I have no idea which they use both, basically it's just a normal circuit, however taking place on drift maps, with all of the tight corners and close quarter chaos that brings with it. And because of their very short nature, you don't even get access to nitrous in this mode. I highly doubt anyone will say that this is their favourite race type in the game, but again, just for the sake of variety and adding something else to do, it's a nice addition. Then there's the Underground Racing League or the URL, one of the more interesting race types here, given how they take place away from the streets on special circuits, either on an actual professional racetrack or once again on the airport runway. No, I have no idea how they set up an entire race course on an active airport's runway or how these criminal racers manage to get access to a whole racetrack to themselves, but who cares when you get to drive on the landing plane? Well, okay, one of the cutscenes does offer a bit of an explanation. They basically just got one of the guys to open the gate. Anyway, these racers also basically take over the role of tournaments, given how they can be either single or multi-race events where you get points after each one. They also differ in the fact that you race against five other people here, though it doesn't really make any practical difference and it doesn't feel any different to race against more opponents. These events are weird because they are just unlike anything else in Underground 1 and 2 and that's kind of the point. They're supposed to be these distraction free races, away from the hustle and bustle and of course the traffic of the city, where it's just about pure racing and again variety for variety's sake, it's great we have this additional mode here. 
However, if they do get old pretty quickly, especially given how many times you have to do these in any given game stage, just to progress, and unlike many of the other races, these are mandatory. Granted, while the track layouts do change, you're still pretty much just racing either on the professional circuit or on the runway. There's just not much that can be done with either after a while. And especially given how there's supposed to be these exclusive invite only races where only the best of the best participate, having them appear so often kind of makes them less special in that way. But again, it's nice to just have a break from that city racing, which you'll be also doing a lot of in this game, and allowing you for the first time in Underground to have a proper race on a proper track. The final new race type, which isn't even a proper race event at all, is Outrun, which you can trigger out in an open world whenever you're behind a rival racer. Here, there is no set track. Instead, you just try to overtake and eventually build up enough lead against your opponent. You choose where you go and you get a small payout at the end if you win. So nothing that exciting. And okay, for completeness' sake, I should also point out there's also SUV exclusive events because yes, there are SUVs to choose from in Underground 2. When it comes to the actual driving, it doesn't differ that much from what we've seen in the first Underground. However, the actual physics of the cars has been greatly improved and they no longer feel light as a feather, thus also not launching you a thousand meters into the air whenever you have an accident. The ludicrous physics have been definitely scaled back in that regard, though it it can still happen from time to time. Another thing you may quickly notice when racing around is that Bayview is a lot flatter than Olympic City. And before you point out that Jackson Heights exists, that's not what I mean here. You may recall all of the jumping over bridges or going up and down hilly roads in the first one, which when partnered with the special cinematic cam sure looked cool, but made it a lot more difficult to drive. And in many instances made it that you can't see what's in front of you leading to a lot of unfortunate accidents which most of the time would just lose you the race. Not to mention the fact that the appeal of these stunts very quickly faded after you had to do them over and over and over again. That is why here the developers decided to not even bother and scrap that all together. And while there's definitely some bumps in the road here or there, there's nothing that would give you that kind of serious airtime that we saw in Underground 1. Which sure you can argue is a bit more boring or giving up too easily, but for long term enjoyment and playability it's important because it was just one of the most annoying factors about driving in Olympic City. Another big change about how races actually play out comes to how you recharge nitrous now. Because yes, this is when nitrous recharging has been introduced. Previously, it was just a finite thing you got at the start of a race. Here, you can actually earn more by performing several different activities. There's kind of things that would give you style points in the first game. Stuff like drafting, for example, or narrowly missing traffic will all recharge your NOS on the go. Is it realistic? No, not at all. But gameplay-wise, it works extremely well and gives that mechanic a whole new reason to exist, especially now that progression and unlocking has been revamped with the sequel. And speaking of unlocking, there's so much more stuff to get for your car this time around. With the customization being expanded a lot, like hydraulics, nitrous purges, trunk audio setups, which is one of the most early 2000s things in this game, and that's saying a lot, and even the ability to customize your hood with custom gauges. I always go for this cat one, I just find it kind of cute, even if it doesn't match the rest of my car at all. Beyond just cosmetics stuff for your car however performance wise there has been a couple of changes as you now choose the individual manufacturer for every single part of a given upgrade which again makes literally no difference and it's only there so the game can name drop all of these brands that they know the target audience at the time loved. Though of course the biggest change when it comes to performance is the custom performance tuning options on the dyno track. This feels like something straight out of a Gran Turismo game and for a more simple racing game like this especially at a time it's actually surprisingly involved with a lot of options almost too many with just no explanation. I mean I like cars and all. However, I literally have no idea what most of these things even mean, and the game, while trying to explain what each part does, doesn't really do a great job of it either. What definitely makes up for that, however, is the fact that you can tune your car on the go whilst on this test track. So you can just pop into the menu, change some settings, and then see how your car reacts. This is all pretty awesome stuff, and again, for that kind of audience at a time who just loved this kind of tuning, it is 
a dream come true. However, thankfully, if like me, you're just not smart enough for this kind of stuff, you can very easily progress through the game without touching any of it. Speaking of, the way progression works now is a lot different and features a lot more examples of things that really don't make sense but have been done for the sake of gameplay. You start off with just the city core unlocked with access to the other areas of the map blocked off. There's no good reason given as to why they are blocked off. The voices on the radio just tell you that the roads have been quote unquote cleared whenever you unlock new areas, but that's it. Couldn't they have at least put a toll booth there or something? Instead of these implied invisible walls. At the start of each stage, you get to choose a sponsor and a sponsorship deal, which has several different tasks you have to complete in that stage, which again brings into question the entire economics of this scene. Like, why are these companies sponsoring illegal underground street races? I have no idea. But again, it doesn't matter because the target audience of this game just wanted to feel like they're getting sponsored by the big popular names in the auto industry and be able to slap the logos on the side of the imaginary cars. As you complete these sponsor deals, you unlock more areas of the map, those being Beacon Hill, Jackson Heights and the two parts of Cold Harbor. And the way that progression for unlocking your items looks like now, after completing enough races, you will sometimes just get a text message telling you that new items have been unlocked. The way they are spaced out is definitely better than in Underground 1, where towards the end of the game you were still getting new things when you had like no races left to use them in, or while still having way too much money. Here it isn't as much of a problem even if money yet again becomes very devalued by around the mid game, which is a shame. Even things like cars, which you'd imagine be the most expensive purchases, are trivial because you get them for free for these sponsored deals, and you don't even need to get more cars anyway. You can very much use whichever car you chose at the start until the very end of the game if you just keep upgrading it. Which don't get me wrong, I like that approach because I just prefer having one car I get used to and attached to that I just keep with me for the whole of my journey. The other thing you unlock is of course magazine and DVD covers which make a return from last time. This time they can be a bit more involved as sometimes you get the option to pose your car yourself and choose the perfect angle which is neat and of course since these are the early 2000s almost all of them have a poorly photoshopped girl on the front of them. I'd love to see a modern Need for Speed game attempt that and see what kind of backlash they get from certain parts of the internet. These are directly tied to the brand new 10 star car rating system and you do need to get your car to a certain number of stars to get onto new DVD covers to progress in the game, tying your car's aesthetic to overall progression, which eh, I have mixed feelings on. First off, it can be infuriating running around a whole city trying to find the one or two parts you haven't equipped yet that will get you over the threshold. It's of course a lot more annoying here, seeing how many new things there are to add and customize. And of course, that also means you have to pick higher end parts over the ones you like more for the sake of progressing. Though of course, you can always switch them back after you're done with the DVD shoot. Maybe this was on purpose, you know. After all, you're not designing a car for yourself, you're designing it to look good on the front cover. Is it a subtle message about staying true to what you prefer versus doing what sells? No, probably not. With the amount of races they have you do in each stage, the game is definitely a lot longer than Underground 1. And sure, it might seem a bit grindy and repetitive at times because of it, however with all of the different race types, it definitely does feel a lot more varied than before. So it's really not too bad when it comes to padding to make it feel longer. And just being able to unlock and explore new areas is a large part of what keeps you going in this game. Plus, of course, the snippets of story throughout, which again, there isn't too much of it, but what is there is just infinitely more ambitious than anything from Underground 1, which is good enough. It's still not anything too amazing or unpredictable, but just good enough. And while I won't spoil the ending, in case you haven't played the game yet, I want it to be as fresh as possible for you guys. However, it's about as predictable and tropey as you can predict. And I do very much recommend you play this game yourself if you haven't. Granted, statistically, you probably have, as the game has sold quite well, and you're probably just watching this video so you can have all your opinions about this game validated. Though it still hasn't sold as well as the first, despite being objectively better in pretty much every single way. So if you haven't played it yet, 
yet. Hopefully this video has convinced you that you should. However, unfortunately getting your hands on a copy of it is going to be as difficult as with the original given how it hasn't been re-released by EA, most likely because of music licensing issues. So you'll be stuck hunting down original copies or you can just download the whole game for free online but <clears throat> anyway, if you are hunting down original copies then obviously the PC version is the one to go for if you want the best experience. It of course visually looks the best and even plays well with modern systems with pretty much no need for tinkering. And what you've been seeing here in this video has been the PC version though with a widescreen fix just so people in the comments don't complain about stretched out objects making a eyes bleed or whatever. Plus it still features great controller support and even support for modern wheels. I said it last time and I'll say it again, given how these ancient games at this point have better wheel support, the Need for Speed Unbound is just hilarious to me and kind of sad. But yeah, if you can play this game on a wheel, do it because it's just ridiculous fun and I love it. And of course the modding scene for this game on PC has been insane with everything from the previously mentioned widescreen patches to higher res support to race and economy rebalancing to complete visual overhauls with things like RTX Remix, delivering a whole new fresh look to this classic game. Because while the original holds up rather well graphically, it's still a game from 2004, which granted Doom 3 came out in 2004 and this ain't no Doom 3, though it's still good enough for a racing game. Though of course the console versions are pretty decent as well, with it being released on all of the 6th gen consoles minus the Dreamcast because who cares. The PS2 one is obviously the most popular one as it was the most popular console, though both the GameCube and Xbox versions will provide you with much better graphics and frame rates. Speaking of, the Xbox version is pretty interesting because it is actually one of the games that's compatible with the 360, however there's a very weird audio stutter in the cutscenes and split screen multiplayer is downright broken, which is a shame because apart from that it's an overall pretty decent way to experience the game. And unfortunately it's not one of the games that Microsoft brought forward to newer Xbox consoles at all. But quickly coming back to the PS2 port, just like with Underground 1, there's a special Japanese version here as well called Need for Speed Underground 2 Shadow, which I'll also make a separate video on, though if you want to know more about these weird Japanese editions, make sure to check out my original video on Need for Speed Underground J. Then there's of course the various handheld versions of the game, starting off with the Game Boy Advance, which is fine, though of course very limited by the hardware. It's still surprisingly involved, even if the amount of various race types has been severely cut down, with probably the most unique element about it being the various mini games in it, which are basically just various card tuning activities, but just taking on a form of a fun little minigame. It plays well enough and controls well enough, however unfortunately the city itself, apart from just not having the layout of Bayview at all, doesn't really feel like Bayview either, it actually reminds me more of Olympic City than anything. And while visually it looks pretty fine and actually kind of impressive at times for a GBA game, like with any handheld device where you can pretty much just count the pixels by hand in an afternoon, things can very quickly turn into a blurry mess of various colours where you just have no idea what even is what. However, for the first time, Need for Speed has also come to Nintendo DS, given how the console launched just a few months back. However, the game itself was only released in May of next year, with both of these Nintendo versions being developed by Pocketeers. This version is surprisingly good. While it borrows most of its elements from the Game Boy version, the city itself actually feels like Bayview and is really nicely designed, the racing itself feels a lot more responsive, and I can actually tell what's going on most of the time. Well, once again, there's not many race types, there is actually a brand new one called Own the Zone, which feels like some very weird predecessor to the mechanics introduced in Carbon, but here you just race around and claim territory, and try to claim the most of it before the race ends. But still, it features quite a lot of customization, and thanks to the increased resolution, you can actually see a lot more of the parts you are buying. Then there's of course Need for Speed Underground Rivals, developed by Team Fusion, which really feels like its own game, which I guess makes sense given how it has rivals at the end of it rather than a 2, so it's more than just a PSP port of the main game. It really is its own thing, and thus it deserves its own video, so definitely subscribe so you don't miss that. However, there is one more version of this game. One which I myself didn't know about until just a couple of months ago doing research for this very video, and that is the Mobile 
phone version. Yeah, this game was ported to Symbian and Brew based phones of the time by Idea Gameworks. And don't worry if you don't know about this either, because very little was known about it for a very long time. In fact, it was actually kind of lost media for a while, with people trying to hunt down the original files. And only earlier this year have the full builds been finally found and posted online. So this is as fresh as it gets. This collection even involves fully emulated x86 versions, so you can play it right on your PC. And I gotta say, it's kind of amazing. Okay, okay, it's still a game for dumb phones from the early aughts. However, for those standards, it is actually very competent. First of all, it looks phenomenal for the hardware at times, and it plays pretty well with different events, and it controls and plays extremely well with a lot of very interesting locations to visit. It even includes its own open world. Well, kind of. It's basically just a loop and is very limited compared to what's in the main PC and home console games, but still pretty impressive, right? And it gives us a whole new interesting version of Bayview. At least I think we're in Bayview, because last time I checked, Bayview wasn't located inside the Grand Canyon. Uh, but well, wait a second. Desert location? Giant dishes? Wait a second. I is this... No, 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 it, it can't be right. It even includes music from the main game. However, it's just limited to highly compressed one minute bytes of some of the main tracks. Plus, it even has all of the cutscenes and story of Underground 2. It's almost the whole package. I implore you to give this version of the game a shot, because it's way more fun than it has any right to be. However, while the game is playable, there are still some missing elements in these versions, because the way the game works is that it actually downloaded race or upgrades from shops from a central server which has obviously been shut down and while most of the races have been restored you cannot purchase anything from the stores so unfortunately it's just not the full experience it was back in the day and probably it will never be unless some psychotically determined genius finds some way around this. I gotta say, when I first started making this video, I honestly had no idea where to even begin describing one of my favorite games of all time, and a game that has always held such an important place in my heart. For me, I know the streets of Bayview better than the streets of my own town at this point, and all of the little details and quirks of it, like how the devs forgot to put district markers for the district of El Norte, so you don't even know when you enter it, or this area of Pigeon Park, where the minimap says there's roads, even when there isn't any. And it's not just me obsessing about all these details. The community around this game and finding every little secret it has has been going strong to this very day. People discussing old maps and design documents, finding any old clips or images of demos or early builds, or going through the game files to find unused assets, textures, graphics, or leftovers from abandoned concepts that never made it to the full game. It is actually insane how dedicated these guys are and props to all of them. And all of those little details come together to make Bayview Bayview, and to make Need for Speed Underground 2 Need for Speed Underground 2. And even after this exercise, I am still confident in saying that it is the best game in the series, are also still probably one of the best racing games ever made. It has the atmosphere and tone, it has the variety in the gameplay, it has an interesting open world, and it actually justifies having that open world, rather than just a marketing gimmick. And it is a shame that we still haven't had any kind of remake, remaster, or any other proper way of getting the game since then, despite how incredibly well it reviewed and how well it's sold. Though obviously, when we're talking about Need for Speed games that sell well, you can't beat the next game in the series, Need for Speed Most Wanted. Though despite its reputation and huge sales, I gotta be honest with you guys, out of the four games that make up that golden age of Need for Speed, as you might call it, Most Wanted is probably my least favorite. But we'll talk about that when that game turns 20 in... Huh? Next year already? Well then. See you all then. Oh yeah, and make sure to check out a Patreon or something, because that helps, I guess.